It is just beyond an honor to be podcast interviewing Dr. Hassam Nozari. And I want to thank Dr. Jason Hill. He's been on the show. Uh, I've been trying to get you on for four years, and my buddy Jason came through for me. Um, he graduated from the University of Brussels in Belgium, University of Reims in France, PhD in biology and health sciences, and University of Southern Cal Advanced Periodontics Program. He was a director of advanced periodontics at USC from 95 to 2012 and a diplomat of the American Board of Perio. He is the founder of the Taipei Academy of Reconstructive Dentistry in Taiwan. Since 2012 to 16, an active member of a review committee for the National Agency for the Evaluation of Universities and research institutes in Italy and served as one of the selected scientific experts charged with assessing and ranking research proposals on behalf of the Italian Ministry of Education, University and Research. He was a guest editor in the chief of the Journal de Periodontology in France and is on the editorial board of clinical implant dentistry and related research. He is the producer of a nonprofit movie, The Enemy of the Smile, and the winner of the Best Short Educational Film and International Family Film Festival 2011, and the Beverly Hills Film Festival, What Killed the Smile of Hatchpoots, a woman who was a pharaoh, won the award of merit 2012 from the accolade competition that honors outstanding craft and creativity in film, television, and videography. He is the organizer of the Nozari Symposium in Beverly Hills at nozarisymposium.com. There is no commercial exhibition of any kind at his symposiums. He has 150 research publications, 84 on PubMed. Um, He was the first person of non-Jewish Iranian Persian heritage to be the keynote speaker at the Israeli Dental Association Congress. I mean, you're... I mean, to call you a legend would be disrespectful to the word legend. Oh, no, I mean, thank, you. thank you so much for finding the time to come on the show. Now, now you're making me wish I would have got a tie. Um, <laughs> but all the store, all the malls are closed. So, how are you doing today? Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much for inviting me. Well, you must have a brain the size of an elephant, or you just have big guts. I mean, you, you I mean, your lecture talk is scientific terrorism, intellectual evil, and COVID nineteen. Wow. And and it's not um, someone saying that who's, you know, your crazy aunt, you know, with a beer in her hand. I mean, you're I mean, you're so credentialed. How do you um, put scientific terrorism, intellectual evil and COVID-19? How does that fit in the same podcast? Well, um, you know, after seven months or even eight months, we do have enough data to make proper decisions. Nobody at this time can say that still we do not have enough data to make proper decisions. If we do say that, we are naive or misguided. We are naive or misguided. Let me give you a few examples. Let's go around the world. We have about six to 700,000 deaths. How is it acceptable that about 23% of them are in the United States of America? Now, if you add a few more countries, Italy, Spain, France, England, rich Western countries. We are practically 50% of all deaths in the world. There is something wrong. And I'm not here to tell people what is wrong. I'm going to share with you some facts, some different kind of statistics, some different, more reliable numbers. And I would like your audience, your students, your colleagues, my colleagues to make decisions themselves. That's why I'm here. Now, if we go to some other countries, let's go, for example, to Japan. Japan has about 127 million population. 127 million population. I've been going to Japan for many years, routinely. The greater Tokyo has about 36 million people. Big city, dense population, high rises metro system, traffic, in the entire country, they have 1,023 deaths. I repeat one more time, in Japan, 127 million people, greater Tokyo, 36 million people. We have 1,000, more than 1,000 deaths, all, that's all we have. Now, let's go to Taiwan. I've been going to Taiwan for 20 years. I organize a big symposium in Taiwan every year. 
and I've been in touch with them all the time. Many big scientists in Taiwan are members of an academy that I founded with Mao Chi Tuan. So Taiwan is a friend country. Taiwan has bright scientists. Taiwan is a big country. Taipei, Kaohsiung, Taochung, high rises, metro system, dense population. We have only seven people dead in this country. Only seven people, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Japan and Taiwan are first countries being exposed to COVID-19. And the data coming from Taiwan, the data coming from Japan is reliable. Let's go to South Korea. If you go to Seoul, big city, dense population, high rises. In this country, we have about 300 people dead. And what is interesting is that they never did full lockdown. They did not do full lockdown. Now, it was predicted by some members of the task force that about 250 million people are going to die in Africa. Let's go to Africa. How, how, many, Africa. how many died in South, in, in North, South Korea? About 300. 300. Exactly 302, and the population is 52 million. 52 million, and no lockdown. Now, I just contacted Young Kim. She was one of my students. Now she's practicing in Seoul. This morning I contacted her, and she told me that everything is under control. This is coming from this morning from Dr. Young Kim. I contacted Hikita Hizato. Dr. Hikita Hizato in Tokyo this morning before coming to your program. He told me the same thing. In Japan, with 127 million population, we have 1,023 deaths. And we have Nagoya, we have Tokyo, we have Kyoto, dense population. And just remember, we have tremendous number of high rises in Tokyo. Tokyo should not be underestimated. And these are reliable people. They do not lie. Now, 250 million people, they were expected to die in Africa. Let's go to Africa. Let's go to Senegal. 16 million people. Death, 64. Let's go to Nigeria. 200 million people. Death, 910. Let's go to the beautiful country of Morocco. Morocco, you have heard about Casablanca, Tangier, Marrakesh. We have about 300 people dead. Let's go to Thailand. Now we go to Asia. 70 million people. We have 58 dead. Let's go to the Philippines. 107 million people. We have 2,123 people dead. Let's go back to Africa. Tunisia. 12 million population. We have 51 people dead. Let's go to Algeria the beautiful country of Algeria, the old country, magnificent country, 44 million people. We have 1,261. Nigeria, 200 million people. We have 910. Nigeria, with 200 million people, we have 910. Beautiful country of Egypt. We are still in Africa. Beautiful country of Egypt. 100 million population, 100 million population of Egypt. We have 4,912 people dead. Now, if you go to some European countries, in Iceland, 364,000 people 
We have only 10 people dead. Now, Japan and Korea and Taiwan were the first countries to be exposed to COVID-19. First countries. About uh, January 14th, the World Health Organization announced that there is no risk of human-to-human -human transmission, which was not a truthful statement. Our friends in Taiwan, they said the opposite. And they contacted us. They said the opposite. We did not listen to them. Why? Again, our friends in Taiwan bright scientists that I know some of them personally, contacted us in the United States of America. And they said that numbers provided by the World Health Organization are wrong. Again, we did not listen to them. Indeed, data from Taiwan was inserted into data from China and we forgot about them. And let me Repeat what I just said a few minutes ago. In Taiwan, big country of Taiwan, we have only seven people dead. And again, I just contacted, I've been in contact with Mao Chi Tuan for weeks and months. The number is reliable, everything is under control, kids are going to school. Never did lockdown. Never did lockdown. Now, in the whole world, we have about six, seven hundred thousand people dead. How can you accept that about 23 to 25 percent of them are in America? Or about 50 percent or more are in America and Spain, north of Italy, England and France. There is something wrong. There is something wrong. Now, a model was made in statistics, we call it a projection model by US task force. The model was based on numbers that were completely wrong. It was a flawed model. And we made decisions based on those models. Now let's go to New York. We have lots of high rises, similar to Tokyo. Let's go to New Jersey. The majority of people dead are in New York and New Jersey, full lockdown. United States is a continent. It's cold in New York and New Jersey, is warm in California. Different ethnicities, different structures, different populations. In cold weather, we did full lockdown of people in those high rises. Some of them, they were made 50, 60, 70 years ago. And practically because of a wrong decision and a flawed model based on wrong numbers, not trusting our real friends in Taiwan, they were killed, not by the virus, not by the virus. Are you surprised that we have such a high number of dead people in New York and New Jersey. Are we surprised? Why we do not see them in Tokyo? Why we do not see them in Seoul? Why we don't see them in Kaohsiung, in Kaohsiung, in Taipei? Why we do not see millions and millions of people dead in Africa? All those projections. And if you do microbiology, if you study virology, your audience, they can uh, read my papers on viruses, our group with uh, Adolfo Contreras, uh, Javier, uh, and Jorgen Slots. We published a significant number of papers about some of the viruses within the oral cavity. One that I like a lot is studying cytomegalovirus in renal transplant patients. If your members, they type my name, Hesam Nozari on Medline, and renal transplantation. They can see the, uh, that study that I published about 17, 18 years ago. Now, 
This virus is not a new one. We know its family. Indeed, it shares lots of its genetics with its cousins, something that gives us what we call it background immunity. Background immunity, cellular immunity. I'm not talking about antibody antigen or antibody antigens. Cellular immunity. Let's go to a cruise, Diamond Princess Cruise, that we can use it as a research model. Total number of people in this cruise are 3,711 people. The crew member, crew members, 1,045. Passengers, 2,666. The cruise is a stock. They cannot get out. The entire cruise is contaminated by COVID-19. The ventilation is common. Rooms are next to each other. Passengers have comorbidities quite often. And the age distribution is more toward the higher end. After your opinion, how many people died in Diamond Princess Cruise? I repeat, we have 3,711 people contaminated. Nobody is welcoming them. They are a stock, closed system. Total COVID death is 14, one four. And those that they died, they had comorbidity. Not a single person from the crew members died. Now, I told you that we do have background immunity. That explains why it's important to identify those that are at risk. And we receive a significant number of reliable data from our colleagues in Japan, Taiwan, and Korea that we did not listen to them. Why we did not listen to them? Target population, comorbidity. This virus is not harmful for kids, young people, even older people that are healthy. Target population, no full lockdown. If this virus has been in America, that we do know based on following the genome of this uh, virus since uh, November. What was the purpose of full lockdown in infected high rises in New York and New Jersey? Are we surprised that the majority of people dead are in nursing homes? Do we really believe that the main cause of their death was the virus? Do we really believe that the cause of death in New York and New Jersey was the virus? And what makes me sad is that, remember, if you are living on the 50th floor, practically for weeks and months, you are breathing the same air that has gone through the lungs of thousands of people in different levels. You are going to breathe it, and it's cold. You have no access to fresh air, and you are stuck in the building. And on top of that, depression, anxiety, some other diseases. And having said that, human metanomovirus, human rhinovirus, enterovirus, mycoplasma pneumonia, parainfluenza, they all have the same signs and symptoms. Now, if you do have also COVID-19, the cause of disease or death is with COVID-19 or by COVID-19. With or by. Now here, we have to start thinking about tests. When you are talking about pregnancy test, is positive or negative? The person is positive or not, dichotomous, black and white. 
Trisomy 21, Down syndrome. Black and white, dichotomous. The newborn baby is going to be affected by trisomy 21 or Down syndrome or not. In virology, it doesn't work that way. Test result requires interpretation. In virology, it does not work that way. It's not dichotomous. Test results require interpretation. And in microbiology, we have different stages. We have contamination. 90% of Americans, that's our own study, with the organ slots, are contaminated by cytomegalovirus. 90% of the population, should I go out and say that 90% of population are infected or are going to become sick because of cytomegalovirus? We all have a strip, we all have a staff. So we do have different stages. First is contamination. That's fine. But then is colonization or antigenic load. The load has to go up. It's not good enough just to be positive or to be contaminated. The load has to go up. We call it colonization. But that is not enough. Then we have infection. It's not enough. Then we have invasion. Now, you're being invaded. Deeper part of your body is going to be affected. But that's not enough. Then we have disease. And that's not enough. Then we have death. We cannot mix all these different stages. We cannot make a projection model based on flawed numbers. We cannot ignore our friends, our scientists in Taiwan, Korea, and Japan, and not to be accountable for that. We cannot inject mortality rate of 8% provided by the World Health Organization after they had said that there was no risk of human-to-human -human transmission. But still, we continue to trust them. We inject those numbers into our statistical model, and based on that, we make decisions. The mortality rate, which was used, was absolutely exaggerated and wrong. Now, if we go back to human metanomovirus, human rhinovirus, enterovirus, mycoplasma pneumonia, or para-influenza, are we going to report possible positive for positive? Any manipulation of data any unreliable data is going to have significant impact. The main reason that our colleagues in Japan, I re remind you one more time, total population 127 million people, only 1,023 people dead. One main reason for being successful was honesty. Honesty and not using inferential statistics, old-fashioned statistics, the way that we are exposed to that here in America, day and night, to create more and more fear. Our friends in Taiwan, they would fine any individual $100,000, American dollars, and or three years prison. You go to prison, if you come, and it spread wrong information, something that we witness with the American media day and night, and still we do, to the point that even members of the task force, days and nights, days and nights, they started talking about a poor tiger in a zoo in New York who was affected. Fear virus, a tiger, a tiger in, the, in New York. Unbelievable. And then cats and dogs, to the point that, I'm sure you have heard about that, thousands of cats and dogs, they were separated from young individuals, thinking that now you are going to die because of your cats and dogs, with significant impact on our youth. Or contamination of different surfaces, food, fruits, 
they are not including by members of the task force? Are they incompetent for this project or ignorant? There is no question that they have been contradictory. There is no question that they would be fined based on Taiwanese law. They would be fined. Maybe they would go to jail for spreading rumors. You never answer questions like that as a leader. Maybe it's possible, who knows? That's exactly what our friends avoided in Taiwan. That's exactly what our friends avoided in Japan. Natural phenomena, they have a distribution. Percentage cannot be abused. And what we are witnessing in America is the abuse of statistics. Let me give you an example. Trial of O.J. Simpson is a good example. Alan Dershowitz says, based on inferential statistics, that my client is a violent man, is not a good husband, is not a good man, but he's not a killer. Alan Dershowitz says that to the jury member. He says 99.9% .9 of people of, that they kill, they beat their wives, they don't kill them. Very convincing. 99.9% .9 of men that they beat their wives, they don't kill them. So yes, he's brutal, he's not a good dad, he's not a good husband, but he's not a killer. It's so convincing, this number, this percentage. But let's look at the reality from a different angle, from real statistics. 95% of women that have been killed by their husbands, that have been beaten first. 95% of the women that they were killed by their husbands, that have been beaten first. So, if you look at 99.9%, .9%, you are convinced that he's innocent. If you look at 95%, the second one, you would be convinced that he's guilty. What we have been hearing from the task force is abuse of statistics. Also, linear scale is routinely used versus logarithmic scale. Linear scale is routinely used in our media, mainstream media, all the time. You look at them, and it's going to make you more fearful. So, we talk about the tiger, we talk about cats and dogs, we talk about money being infected, rumors, more and more rumors, full lockdown, of people in winter, cold weather in New York and New Jersey, old buildings, same ventilation, elder population, they cannot see their family members, depression, other diseases, heart disease, anxiety, away from family members. Are we really surprised that we have such a high mortality rate in New York and New Jersey? Now, we never use median and mode. We all the time use average. Again, something that the task force, members of task force have been doing it all the time. Also the World Health Organization, also CDC. And that can also be very misleading. Average really means nothing if you don't know what the mode and what the median is. So briefly, you are using poor quality statistics we are using linear scale, we are using averages, we are using percentage, we are using dichotomous testing for misinforming people and possibly our decision makers. And we are also using possible positive for positive. And we did not pay attention to age distribution. And when you are dealing with a chaotic system, 
Our decisions are made based on principle of uncertainty and probability. And if you do not have reliable data, there is no need to make a projection model if it's going to be used for decision making. So let's go back and see the earth. Senegal, 16 million people, 64 people dead. Egypt, 100 million people, 4,912 people dead. Nigeria, 200 million people, 910. Algeria, 44 million people, 1,261 people dead. Japan, 127 million, 1,023 people dead. No full lockdown. Korea, 52 million people dead. Uh, population, 302 people dead. No full lockdown. Schools are open. Sweden, primary school, secondary school is open. They inform people. They stopped spreading rumors. They did not play the game of poor quality statistics. Mauritania, 5 million people, 157 people dead. There are those 250 million people dead in Africa. Thailand, 70 million, 70 million people, 58 people dead. Mali, 20 million people, 124 people dead. Chad, 16 million people, 75 people dead. Singapore, 6 million people, 27 people dead. And we have to stop saying that Singaporeans are not being truthful. We have to stop saying that Japanese are not being truthful. We have to stop saying that Taiwanese are not being truthful. We have to stop saying that Koreans are not being truthful. They are all our friends. I went to school in France and I did some part of my studies with some people that are now decision makers in some African countries, such as Senegal. Don't think that their success is uh, based on luck. No, they were not lucky. They were responsible. They were sincere, they were honest. And they were trained in good schools. They were competent. They were competent and they are competent. Tunisia, 12 million people, 51 people dead. Iceland, only 10 people dead. Now, there are some questions that we have to answer. How many people they died on that cruise? 14 people. Full contamination. 3,700 3, people almost. Not a single person died from the crew. And then if you look at the numbers, for example, about flu. Between October 1st, 2019 and April 4th, 2020, between October 1st, 2019 and April 4th, 2020, we have had up to 56 million illnesses, 56 million illnesses because of flu, possibly up to 7 740,000 hospitalization, 740,000 hospitalization, and possibly up to 62,000 deaths, and 169 pediatric deaths, according to CDC, according to CDC, for flu. So I really don't want to tell people how to think or what to think. I really believe that we are not using critical thinking anymore. We are going back to dark age. We don't teach critical thinking anymore in our schools. We teach people to become skillful. We teach people to become a good attorney, to become a good pilot, to become a good surgeon. But let's go back to Darwin. Don't tell me what to think. Teach me how to think. Let's go back to Louis Pasteur. Don't tell me 
what to think. Teach me how to think. Critical thinking is something that we don't teach anymore. We follow the media. And we have to remember that a small number of big companies, they run the media. Gatekeepers of knowledge, they are. Gatekeepers of news, they are. Doesn't matter that we have thousands of different media. Small number of companies are running the show. We have about 7,000 journals, medical journals. The majority of them are useless. The majority of them are useless. We have a big problem. We have a big problem. And I'm concerned because I've been teaching full time at USC for 22 years. And I really feel honored to be on your program. And I'm here as a teacher to tell you that our educational system is at risk. If we close our educational system, if we close our educational system, before you know it, we lose our country. Our educational system is under attack. Trusting science is under attack. And if a nation does not trust science anymore, if a nation deprives its youth from education and quality research, within a short period of time, we will disappear. And I have here a picture with Gore Vidal. I would like to share with you. We were good friends. We did some projects together with Gore Vidal. And we did a symposium together. And I would like to quote something that he told me, that we have too many gatekeepers of knowledge in this country. We have too many gatekeepers of news in this country. And that's our biggest risk. That's our biggest risk. We have to learn to analyze. We cannot trust data. What we can trust is data analysis. We cannot trust percentage. What we can trust is the Bayesian understanding of percentage. We cannot trust means, but we can trust mode, median, and means altogether. We cannot trust the linear scales. They can be very scary, but completely harmless. We need critical thinking. We have to teach critical thinking. Look at what happened to admission scandal. We had people coming to school, to universities, including University of Southern California, because they had paid. We should not continue to make people skillful. We should not continue to buy our certificates. It's such a big privilege to be American. I have lived in so many different countries. I have lived in Belgium, in Brussels, never paid for my education. I have lived in France, never paid for my education. And now I'm living in America. And I can tell you that we are so fortunate to live in America. And just remember, it's, so, it's such a big mistake to think that it's granted. Freedom is not granted. Liberty is not granted. Critical thinking is not granted. Education is not granted. I'm really concerned. That's why I really came today to share with you a few numbers so we can start thinking. Why the projection model is still being used? How many more times members of the task force have to make mistakes? Are they really competent? Are they really honest? Why we have so many people dead in New York and New Jersey? That's basically something that I would like to share with you. If there are any questions, if you have any questions, I would be glad to answer your questions. But just a few facts. And again, uh, data that I shared with you from other countries, as much as I could, I shared with my colleagues, with my friends in those countries. But to let you know one more time that our friends in Taiwan, in December, 
they informed decision makers in America that numbers from the World Health Organization are not correct. I know that, I know the exact date. And I know how many times they try to do that. And remember, let me finish with this one. In Taiwan, one of the first countries being exposed to COVID-19, we have only seven people dead, no full lockdown, educational system is working. Thank you so much. Wow. Wow. Thank you so much for having the um, insight, the, the guts to say that. I mean, it, it was amazing. Um, first question, what do you think of Anthony Fauci's leadership in this response to the pandemic? Incompetent. Incompetent. You know, having certificates doesn't mean anything. Being in a leadership position does not mean anything. What really matters is what you have done. I think that after seven months, eight months, we have enough data and we have enough documents. I would like your audience to go back on YouTube, go back on different stations and listen to them one more time. Go back in November, go back in December. Go back in December, our friends in Taiwan inform them in December, go back in January, listen to them one more time. Listen to them when they were talking about Kawasaki disease, Kawasaki-like disease, just to create more and more fear with women as young as 20, 22, 23, that they were going to give birth, but now they're so scared that my newborn baby is going to die. Go and listen to what they said about pizza, being infected. Go back and listen to them about what they said about cats and dogs and about this poor tiger. Go and listen to them one more time. They are all available. They are all available. But I can tell you, in my department, they would be fired. There is something that you cannot accept in research. The most important thing maybe in research is to be truthful. And if you do not know the answer, to say this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful sentence, I don't know. That's something that we don't use it often enough. And it's such a beautiful, powerful statement. I don't know. I don't know will help our students, our young researchers to generate hypotheses and to test them. I don't know will help them to generate new questions and share those questions with others and to test them. But when your answers are confusing, when your answers are so dishonest, let me give you one example with The Lancet, one of our most prestigious journals. Because up to now, the task force has not designed any quality research project to test, for example, z pack corticosteroid inhalers, hydroxychloroquine. Still, we have not designed any good study. But then suddenly, there is this one study published in Lancet against that. And within one week or two weeks, Lancet, our most prestigious journal, is rejecting that, saying that it was flawed. Numbers were manufactured. How can we accept that? If we do not trust science, if we cannot trust our journals anymore, we have 7,000 journals, the majority of useless anyhow. So we have few that are, that are reliable. If we cannot trust them anymore because they accept publishing data, possibly for political reasons, what is going to happen to our future? You know, now uh, I talk about science, I have another good friend <laughs> who is uh, Buzz Aldrin. I know Buzz Aldrin for many, many years. And truly, I feel so privileged to know so many wonderful people. I wish you could see all the pictures and the friendship that we have. A man who placed the flag of this country in the moon forever. 
And he was telling me that he was a military guy, but there was one purpose for that flag, to celebrate American culture, to celebrate science, was not to celebrate our military power, to celebrate really science. And I'm sure you all know what it took for them to get there. There was no computer, nothing unbelievable more than half a century ago. It is really a privilege to live in America. It is truly a big honor to live in America. And let me tell you something that uh, I was not born in this country. I've had very high positions in this country. I've had high positions in some European countries. I have never ever been victim of any kind of racism in America. And I'm really, I can tell you something, never ever. And I'm now, I'm in Beverly Hills. Still, I do lots of good projects, do good projects here. But one reason that we have been so successful is because of quality research, is because of quality education, is because of quality universities. But is it still the case? Is it still the case? We have to be very careful. You, I asked you, um, what do you think of Dr. Anthony Fauci's uh, response? You said incompetent. Um, compare the Prime Minister of Japan's response, Shinzo Abe, versus uh, Donald Trump in America. What, what? How would you? What? How would you um, describe Donald Trump's response? You know, I do not want to get involved in political decision makers. I just want to talk about science. I just want to take, talk about science. You have scientists in Taiwan that some of them I know personally. You have scientists in Japan, some of them I know personally. Those scientists, they contacted scientists, decision makers in America. Now, you have GSET. We have fantastic microbiologists in Iceland. They informed us about the genome of this virus. They told us that this is not a military virus. This is not a edited virus. But why did we spend so much time talking about whether or not this virus is edited? And it's so easy to answer those questions. Why people with that cruise, they get contaminated. They are positive, but they don't die. And some of them, they have no symptom. What does it mean background immunity? What does it mean, TISA? Test and testing, are they really the same? Is it pregnancy test? That day and night, we engage people in debates that they are so unfair about testing, about animals, about pizza, about tigers, about cats and foods, about percentage, about mean, about linear scales. That's the problem. So I'm really here to have a talk within the scientific community, within the scientific community. And I really believe that decision makers, left or right, they can do whatever they want. But something that we cannot accept is scientific evil, is intellectual evil, is scientific terrorism. That's something that we cannot accept. That's why I don't want to really get involved in politics at all, left or right, I really don't. I love the country no matter who the president is. That's the beauty of this country. Every four years, we have this opportunity to vote. We have one of the most beautiful constitutions on earth. We have fabulous research centers here. I have published on Midland 84 papers with Jorgen Slots from Denmark, with Adolfo Contreras from the country of Colombia, with my colleagues in France. That's so unique to this beautiful country. I really care about the country. The reason I'm here is just to tell you that if we lose our trust in science, if we lose our trust in research, the future is dark. The future is dark. And we have to stop trusting people because of their titles. It doesn't matter that they are professors. The majority of our professors, they do not know anything about critical thinking. 
because we don't teach it anymore. We do not teach it anymore. We have more and more certificates. And admission scandal, admission scandal, that University of Southern California was heavily affected by that, is a good example. According to our government, history of education has never seen something like that. History of education in America has never ever seen corruption like that. And go and read it. Go and see how companies, they had relationship with teachers. How companies, they had relationship with uh, staff, with decision makers. So let's go back to science. Let's criticize science. Let's be critical of that. Let's be critical of our scientists. Let's be critical of our projection model. Let's find out why it's wrong. Let's find out why inferential statistics, the way it's used, should not be used. Or about percentage. Let's think about O.J. Simpson. When Alan Dershowitz threw this number, 99.9% .9 of the people, that they beat their wives, they don't kill them. So my client is innocent. Very convincing, 99.9%, .9 very convincing. That's what you hear with the media. Maybe that's what our decision makers are hearing. But on the other hand, the other side of the coin, 95% of women that are killed, they were beaten first. That's really our biggest challenge. Well, let's go back to your... Let's go back to your comment on uh, the Lancet and publishing since you're out in, uh, are you in Beverly Hills right now? Yes. You look as fancy as Beverly Hills. I love your, <laughs> I love your attire. Uh, but the LA Times uh, published a story uh, that the COVID-19 could kill the for-profit publishing uh, model and the, um, the American Dental Association uh, signed a letter to Donald Trump um, scoring how uh, they're concerned about the uh, publishing model and the 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 counter to that is our taxpayers pay for all this research and then it goes behind all these firewalls uh for profit and they they think this research should be transparent um did you see that uh, article um um that the um, from the la times on that no i'm not um, it, it was, um, uh, yeah, it was, uh, but anyway, so what do you think of the, um, the, for publishing model, like, uh, the, like JADA? You know, um, the problem with our organizations, the many of them that are in leadership position, they're not qualified. And what they do is copy paste, copy paste. It's easy to be covered. It's easy to copy paste. It's easy to watch a news, uh, agency and repeat that you may think that I'm not taking any risk. And that's what we are seeing these days, copy paste, copy paste. So, uh, and that's a big mistake. That's not America. In America, we don't copy paste. In America, we just don't follow. That's why I really, it has been a long time I'm not following these organizations. My source of information is uh, GSET, is Anto Pasteur in France, is Centre National de Recherche Scientifique, supported by the government, is Stanford, we have wonderful scientists back there. We have wonderful sources of information, not media. Agree. So right now, the que the biggest question on Dental Town is dentists are struggling with: Should I send my kids back to school? What What would you say? I, I, absolutely, our educational system is under attack. That's the biggest concern that I have. Look at the age distribution. Look at what our friends from Japan and Korea and Taiwan told us. This virus targets specific part of the population, elderly population with significant contributing factors, not over youth. But if we do full lockdown in high rises for weeks and months, we are going to cause problems. Why we have so many young people, young nurses, young doctors die dead in hospitals because of hospital infection, dehydration, pneumonia, fatigue, abuse of antibiotics. We kill them by wrong decision makings. We kill them. That's the problem that we are facing. But my point is that why we should trust them? They have been wrong for seven, eight months. Why we should trust them? We don't make decisions like that in our laboratories. We don't make decisions like that in our research centers. There is no room for this kind of mistakes. And our educational system is the heart 
of this country. We cannot shut down our educational system. We cannot. Absolutely, I'm for that. They have to be opened. But we can go back, bring new people, bring people that are qualified, bring people that are honest, bring people that are reliable, bring people that are competent to move forward, to make proper decisions. And remember, America is a continent. America is not a small country. Some parts of the country is winter, some parts are summer. Some parts, they have a different ethnicity, different population, different culture, different seasons. We have to empower local authorities. But ultimately, they all should lead to the same thing, to open safely our educational centers, our research centers as soon as possible. That's some, it's not something that we can play game with that. That's not something we can play game with that. And remember, when it comes to flu, our kids are really at risk, way, way more than when it comes to COVID-19. And remember one more time that this virus, we know it's family for decades. For decades, we know it's family. It's not new. It shares a significant number of its genome with its cousins that has given us some background immunity. And that's why many, many people that are positive. I believe about uh, 500 million people on Earth are already positive. I believe so. And I believe already in uh, January, February, millions of Americans, they were already positive. They were already positive. Many things that we are doing now, we should not do it, and we should have done it at that time. So, um, just in the news today, um, out there in your area, I'm trying to stay in your area, uh, Joe Rogan is leaving Texas. He's uh, so upset with the uh, response of California. He's packing it up and leaving in Texas, and he says his eight best friends are going, you know, have left too. Um, do, uh, does a response from I don't want to I know you're not supposed to talk about politics, sex, religion, and violence, and we're not talking about politics, just gratuitous. But um, what do you think of um, um, your governor uh, Gal, uh, Galvin Newsom and his response? And do you think it's uh, a good response, or do you think he's causing people to leave the state like Joe Rogan? Well, you know, people from California are wonderful. They really listen. They are confused. For example, they see their own mayor kneeling with no mask, no social distancing, and then he's going to give fine to people that they are not following his rules, being contradictory. That's the problem. But then blaming people, you know, every day when I walk, when I talk with my staff, they are so wonderful. People in California are so wonderful. They listen. When we had shortage of water, they asked people not to use water. And it was unbelievable, unbelievable what people they did. And it's well documented. It's well documented. These are the kind of people that we have. Californians are the most generous people when it comes even to other countries. The most generous people. When we have fire, you can witness that every single time, every single time, how wonderful they are. I really mean it from my heart, how wonderful they are. But then you have to set an example as well. You cannot be contradictory. You cannot say something here, a different thing another time. And then Dr. Farah, Barbara Farah, who's in charge of LA County. Her PhD, her, he, she's a doctor, but she's a doctor in welfare. I mean, doctor in welfare, I, I don't know if it's good or bad, but what makes her qualified? And the other problem that we have is this title of doctor. We give it too easily to people. We give it too easily to people. Doctor, in my opinion, is somebody who has contributed to the progress of science. And that contribution has been confirmed by three independent universities, not only one, because your own university is going to give it to you. So you have to contribute to progress of science approved by three different universities and it's published. But here we give it so easily to people and then when they come on TV, they say doctor, let's say Farah or doctor this and doctor that, and people, they think they know what they're talking about. That's the problem that we have. So I'm, t I'm saying that because that title of doctor is coming also from our educational system. And again, when it comes to educational system, I'm very sensitive about that. For 22 years, I've been a full-time teacher. Jorgen Svart knows that. I was going to university at 6 a.m. in the morning, coming home at 10 at night. When my daughter was born at 8.30 in the morning, at 10 o'clock, I was at work. 
I love educational system. It's unbelievable the educational system in, in, in this country. And that's why I'm really sensitive about that. I'm very disappointed, very disappointed. Admission is conduct, very disappointed. Lancet, accepting article, which is completely manufactured, very disappointing. 7,000 journals, one is worse than the other one, very disappointing. About 80% of our research publications are flawed, very disappointing. Not teaching critical thinking, very disappointing. Just giving people certificates, very disappointing. All these nonsense CE courses, weekend courses, very disappointing. About 75% of our treatments are over-treatment, over-diagnosis, very disappointing. So I think that we can use this COVID-19 positively. Let's use it positively. Let's take a lesson. Let's revise everything. Let's go back to good generation. Let's go back to the generation of Buzz Aldrin. Let's go back to the generation of Gore Vidal. Let's go back to good generation. They all had something in common, and it was love for this country, based on integrity, based on dignity. So you, um, when you said 75% of our treatments are over-treatment, was that for MDs or DDSs? I attended a symposium in Morocco a few years ago, and one of the speakers presented solid data. I have to find it and send it to you. He talked about dentistry, but medical treatment is not far from that. And I'm a good witness of that in Beverly Hills. Over treatment, over treatment. We sell treatment, actually. We sell it to people. A treatment is becoming like a product. Uh, and we have a big problem with that, high tuition. Many of our students, when they graduate, they just want to pay the tuition back. Do you really believe that going, for example, to dental school at USC is worth so many hundreds of dollars a day, a day? So speaking of MDs that are saying things, there was uh, two MDs. Again, I'm staying in your state, uh, Bakersfield, California, uh, two doctors um, had a press conference, Dan Erickson and Artin Masihi. Um, and their videos were taken down on YouTube. Uh, what did you think of that of that whole event? It is awful. I mean, that people, they have to be exposed. That's what makes this country so beautiful. People are free. They have to be, uh, people, they decide. But what we do not see as our scientists, we see so-called specialists. But which one of them is a specialist? They are not really. People, they just come and they give their views. And it depends on your agent. Your agent is going to get you into that media or whether or not you have published a book and you want to promote it. That's where we are, is entertainment. Let's go back to what Gore Vidal said. We do have gatekeepers of news, gatekeepers of knowledge, and that's a big problem. And we are going to pay the price for that. And today we are paying the price for that. So I disagree with all those uh, behavior that it reminds me some of the Middle East countries. We don't behave like that here. We let people to be exposed to data, and then we have to uh, let them decide. Um, and data I, analysis. Um, it, it's still a debate on Dental Town about hydroxychloroquine. I mean, it's just it just doesn't it stays in the news. What 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 do you th when I say that word? What what do you think of that whole event? Issue? You know, hydro hydroxychloroquine was uh, presented by Didier Raoult in Marseille. Didier Raoult is one of the brightest microbiologists that we do have. I knew him before he becomes uh, famous. Everybody who has studied microbiology knows him. He has about 96 microbes under his name. He has discovered them. I don't know if you have heard about giant virus or not. Giant virus was discovered by him. Both him and his dad, Didier Raoult, they have done a lot for infectious diseases, and especially in Africa. That's one reason that, for example, in Senegal, in Ivory Coast, they did high quality RT-PCR, polymerase chain reaction, to detect the virus many, many months ago is because of him. Also, some of the virologists in Wuhan, in China, they were his students. So his students from China, they contacted him. And according to Schwartz, Olivier Schwartz from Anstopastor in Paris, they have never seen such beautiful collaboration between scientists that we saw already in January. Not between, I'm not talking about politicians, between scientists, Chinese scientists, French scientists, African scientists, German, Australian scientists. We were sharing information. And that's why when our friends from China, they shared with us the genome of the virus, they were truthful. 
And some of them, they were students in Astopasto. They went back to China. So they told Didier Raoult that they have been using uh, corticosteroids, uh, they have been using hydroxychloroquine, and they have been using z -Pak. So he trusted them because he trusted his students. So he used that in Marseille. And in Marseille, he has about 100 PhD working for him, a fantastic center. Is the second biggest center in the, in the whole world. Is, in Europe, is unique. So what he did on a daily basis, about five to 700 people in Marseille, they were tested and they were getting early treatment. Don't waste your time. Early treatment and uh, to support the vulnerable population. And I was listening to him a few weeks ago and he said that the mortality rate in Marseille with him has been only 0.2%. 0.2%, much, much better than many other cities in uh, in, uh, in France or in other European, European cities. So the person is reliable, is Didier Raoult. He's a bright scientist, his father is a good man. Uh, if I'm not wrong, he's living in a very small apartment, very small apartment. He doesn't, he can make lots of money, but it's not his personality. Uh, he, he has he's a different personality. He may sound arrogant, but he's not really. He doesn't have anything to prove to anybody. And look at his background, look at his publications. So the source was reliable. He said that I've been using hydroxychloroquine, I've been using z but you have to use it carefully, cautiously. And early treatment was his message all the time. Early treatment, don't wait. Don't wait. And that's something that also our colleagues, they were doing in Korea and in Taiwan. Telemedicine, telemedicine, supporting elderly population. Now, still we don't have a well-controlled randomized clinical trial. But my point is that why our colleagues in the task force, they didn't design a good uh, research project to, to answer that question. Why do you have to still debating hydroxychloroquine? Why? They have so much budget. They have so much money. Why they didn't sit for one hour to design a good study and finish it once for good? But they still are talking about that. That's the problem that I have. Why we spend so much time, so many days and weeks about a tiger, about a tiger in a zoo in New York? Why they spend so much time about pizza? Pizza being the cause of infection, why? So hydroxychloroquine, still we don't have a good study, but the person who's promoting that is a good person, is a good scientist, has published extensively, has discovered many microbes. Having said that, look at the mortality rate. If the mortality rate is really so low, maybe we don't need it. Maybe what we need is management. Always go back to numbers. What is the mortality rate? Newborn babies, are they at risk? No. Young people, school children, no. Adult healthy, no. Elderly population healthy, no. Something is very unique about this virus. The speed of contamination, but not the power, is not powerful. Background immunity, do we have it? Yes. And then testing, which test should be used? Remember, we have contamination, we have colonization, increasing the antigenic load, infection, invasion, disease death. Should we mix it or should we do as it was suggested by Didier Raoult in Marseille? So right now, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to pin you down on action points. I mean, I know you say, um, you know, you gave quotes, um, don't tell me what to think, teach me how to think. But there's a lot of young kids in dental school. Uh, you know, 25% uh, of my listeners are still in dental kindergarten school. The rest are under 30. Uh, the young dentist, uh, their hygienists are afraid to come back to work. They've changed, um, you know, they've added all these PPE and air filters and UV lights. Um just take a break on teaching how to think and tell them what to think. I mean, what what would you do if you had a dental office right now? I mean, what, what would you be thinking? Uh, Howard, have you heard about anybody becoming sick in a dental office up to now? Have you heard anything? No. Has there been any report? Uh, well, yesterday in Colorado, um, let's I'll pull it up here. Uh, yesterday in Colorado. Uh, okay, here it is. Um, yesterday, uh, two Colorado Springs dental offices have reported COVID-19 outbreaks, according to data provided by El Paso County Health Department. Uh, that was in the news. I tweeted that out. Um, I know you're on Twitter. I follow you. Um, um, COVID-19 outbreaks reported two dental offices in Colorado Springs, according to data provided by El Paso County Public Health. One of the dental offices, um, 
The outbreak was reported on July 22 with five confirmed cases. The second outbreak, uh, the office located uh, two confirmed cases. An outbreak is defined as two or more confirmed cases within 14 days with evidence of transmission within the facility. The uh, purpose of this list is to alert the public of local outbreaks so anyone who may have an infection can re- blah, 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 blah. So that was, that, that's the, that was the first, and, I, and that was uh, published uh, um, August 3rd. After and seven today months. Today is August 6th. After seven months. Right. Now, we always assumed that our patients, they have hepatitis. We always taught our students that we should assume that our patients are affected by AIDS, HIV virus. We always assumed that they have, there is a possibility of infection. We train our students in that. We always assume that. Much nastier viruses. And I think that's why dentists are good examples of teaching others how to, to apply that, because you are good examples. And that's why you see such a low uh, rate of uh, contamination because of dentists. After so many, many months, we just have few reports here and there. Even that, we really have to check it to see what it means exactly, which kind of test was used, what was the real cost. But overall, you don't see too many. You don't see too many. And again, let me repeat one more time. We always assume that our patients that are infected by other viruses, much more stronger viruses. So what do you, what do you think of the typical dental office who's, um, you know, they've, they've, um, they've gotten rid of their waiting room. You're sitting in the car. You take your temperature when they walk in. What, what do you think of that whole protocol? How, uh, do you, what, you know, what's your assessment? Uh, taking temperature is wonderful. Uh, and I was always wondering why we don't do that in LAX in America. Over the last 20 years, I've been going to Japan and Taiwan. Every single time they were doing that in the airport. It was so impressive and it was so simple to do that. I think there is a lot that we should learn from Taiwanese. I would really like to recommend to members of the task force, trust Taiwanese, trust our friend in Japan and Korea. Maybe you have to revise what you think about the world health organization. Maybe it should be tougher with them. But uh, trust them. Let's use them as example. I contacted Mao Chi Tuan. Mao Chi Tuan is the, our president of Taipa Academy of Reconstructive Dentistry. His uh, uh, clinic is open. His classes are open. He teaches all over the country with 40, 50, 60 students. On a routine basis, he sent me the pictures. So I really think that we should move forward. We have been doing things correctly up to now. We have to continue what we have been doing up to now. There is no reason to be fearful. We have to continue doing what we have been doing up to now. So, so to be succinct, the, the, the fear is that, you know, the United States is 4% of the population and a quarter of the deaths, and you said the other ones were in other countries with a lot of old people, you know, Italy, Spain, whatever. So, um, so it's SARS, COVID-2 is easily spreadable but not very powerful. Um, you're saying that these young kids um, going to school were, were probably should be more afraid of the flu than the coronavirus. Um, you say schools should be open. Um, a lot of dentists my age have kids in college. Uh, would you be sending your kid back to ASU and USC and UCLA? Absolutely. 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 W- would you the have damage- them be wearing masks and social distancing and not shaking hands? You know, the damage that we have caused is tremendous. I have seen so many university students, university students crying, crying, anxiety, suicide rate. The damage is tremendous and it's shameful to cause fear for them. There is always risk in life. There is always risk in life. But we have made something so unfair to our young people, to our students. Just let me remind you one more time. We talked days and nights and weeks about pizza. Pizza causing problem for you. And tagging and cats and dogs. We really have to stop that. We have to let our students to go to university. We have to trust them. The same way that when they trusted us about water, we were all respectful. When we, we had shortage of water, that's who Americans are. We have to trust Americans. Americans, they follow the rules. But don't fool them. Don't cause fear. Don't let fear to be their, your, their uh, uh, motivating factor. They don't need that. We are not living in China. We are not living in Venezuela. We are not living in some Middle East countries. We are living in America. Inform them they know what to do. Inform them what they know what to do. And remember, 
How many times we have been talking about how to use properly the mask? None. Look at members of the task force, how they touch their own masks. Members of the task force, how they touch their masks, how they remove it to talk and they put it back when they're not talking. I mean that we have been showing nonsense to people. They don't even know how to respect infection control. Task force members, they don't know that. I really think we have to stop following them blindly. That's my point, following them blindly. So answering uh, your question, absolutely. I want my daughter to go back to university as soon as possible. I don't want her to go to Zoom class. Studies they have shown that they are ineffective. I was talking with a teacher. I don't want to mention his name. He said that, first, I even don't know if they're listening to me, number one, and possibly they don't. Many of them, they just come to show their face and then they go do something else. And finally, he said, I don't talk to them like I was talking before, because you don't know who is listening, who is not listening, if they are going to use it against you or not. That human contact, human touch is gone. And that's really something that we need. That's what we need to be together to support each other. That's the beauty of teaching. That's the beauty of teaching. And I'm qualified as a teacher for 22 years full time to tell you that this Zoom is nonsense. It, that's not how you can teach people. That's not how you can teach people. We have, they are paying lots of money. This whole notion of campus is so unique to America. Is a, it reminds me of Medici's uh, dream in Italy, Medici's dream, this campus, this contact, this share of information, and we cannot deprive them from, them, from that. Um, you say you saw students crying. I hear you. Absolutely. Um, and I've seen hygienists cry. Um, they're, they're, they're scared. Um, they're afraid they're coming back to work and they might have a couple kids at home. What would you tell a um, hygienist who's worried that she's too close to a patient and she's going to catch COVID-19? How, how about hepatitis? How about HIV? How about the... Uh, Nomovirus, rhinovirus, how about that? We have always been at risk. And again, as I said, early in our education, we teach our hygienists how to protect themselves. We teach our students how to protect themselves. Much, much better than physicians. If you go for a consult with a physician, the way that they behave, look at the way dentists or hygienists are behaving. We didn't know that. And if your hygienist, with all the education they have received, in infection prevention, still they are scared. Maybe they should change their job. Maybe they should change their job. But again, as I said, they know what to do. They know how to protect themselves. And then they should not be scared. They have to look at data. They have to look at data. And always remember, we always assume that our patients are infected by much nastier viruses. So if you were uh, anointed the czar of Corona for the United States of America, what would you, what would be your list of what you would just start trying to change immediately? You know, uh, a Taiwanese, they suggested about 100 some uh, points. And actually I would like to congratulate the prime minister of New Zealand, wonderful lady. And you know that she stopped the problem and they had only about 20 some dead, that's all in New Zealand. And she gave uh, credit to Taiwanese. She thanked them for that. There are so many other countries, they thank Taiwanese. Germans, they thank Taiwanese. Well, I would go back to see, to begin with, why we didn't trust them. To begin with, why we injected this 80% mortality rate in our projection model. To begin with, why we did not use telemedicine. To begin with, why we did not support our elderly population. To begin with, why we did not support people with high blood sugar people with high blood pressure, immunocompromised, chemotherapy, radiotherapy, target population. And then finally, Japan is a big country. So Tokyo, Kyoto, Nagoya, they empowered local authorities. The job of the center was to create harmony, to support. America is a big continent. Why we are treating everybody the same way? Why we go on media and talk to the whole continent, the whole 350 million people the same way, the same style? and why we allow people to spread rumors. Remember, Taiwan is $100,000, American dollars, fine or and three-year prison, if you spread rumors, if you answer questions that are not meaningful. So that's what I would do, really. Uh, and you know, uh, Howard, if you go back 
there is something which is called disease distribution. If you go back two years ago, four years ago, five years ago, the distribution is within the norm. So easily we can manage it. And we have so many good examples now in the world. That's why I had that list for you, to go all over the world. In Africa, 250 million people, they didn't die. They didn't die. In Japan, people, they didn't die. In Korea, people, they are not dying. In Egypt, people are not dying. In India, 1.2 billion people, 1.2 billion people, people are not dying. People are dying only in America. Why? Why the numbers, we cannot trust it anymore. Why we leave the diagnosis to clinician? Why we are using the tests that we are using that are not reliable at all? Why we call contamination positive, infection positive, disease positive? But you're mixing all those numbers. It's going to be misleading. So that's the first thing I would do. I would bring a good group of sincere, sophisticated scientists, epidemiologists to revise the numbers. To revise the numbers, to communicate with people, to give them the real numbers. To stop spreading rumors. Why our teachers are making decisions the way they are making now? Why our students, our hygienists? They are because they are bombarded by numbers that are all flawed. So you personally, how, what are you doing differently in your behavior since um, the World Health Organization declared this pandemic? I mean, are you going to restaurants, bars, movie theaters? Tell me about what you're doing. You know, yeah, I go to restaurants. I would like to support them. I know many of them. It's a tough business. Uh, we stay outside. Uh, they respect the distancing. Uh, they're very respectful. They follow the rules. Wash your hand with soap and water. Don't touch your face. You don't need all these bizarre chemicals. You don't have to use them left and right to cause some other problems. Just be reasonable. Wash your hand with soap and water. Look, Howard, for example, from day week or two, we knew that soap and water is good enough because we know this coronavirus family. But look at how many weeks, including members of the task force, we spend time about which kind of chemical we have to use. And then we cause so many problems for people. So many problems we cause for people. Many people, they kill themselves because they didn't know what to do. They exaggerated the utilization of those products. Soap and water is that simple. Soap and water. And then you don't have to go and wash your pizza. You don't have to go and wash your hamburger, wash your french fries, use all these chemicals. And then don't touch your face. And then support the restaurant owners. Now they're providing this beautiful um, service outside the restaurants. Tables are distanced from each other. Um, they're very respectful. You use your iPhone to check the menu. Um, when you have to pay, the same thing. You know, you don't touch them, they don't touch you. It's just wonderful. I mean, we really have to support them as much as we can. Otherwise, we are going to lose them. Their are at risk. They have paid a big price for that. So I've heard it, that up to 50% may go bankrupt. Is it safe to say that a pediatric dentist practice could go far back to normal easier than, say, a periodontal practice? Where no, most... they're both, both the same. Both the same. Okay, they're both the same. What would, you tell, what would you tell a mom who calls a pediatric dentist and says, I'm afraid to bring my kid in, it might be uh, risky. And the other side, um, a periodontist office, uh, most of the people that need perio are elderly people They uh, that need uh, perio and implants, et cetera. What, what would you say to the mom who was uh, at the pediatric dentist and what would you say to her grandmother at the periodontist office? That if they don't feel comfortable, not to come. If they don't feel comfortable, not to come. But having said that, that we are following the rules, what the rules are. We have to be respectful when it comes to rules. We are following the rules. And also numbers. Up to now, I have not heard any problem from any office, I have not. And my office, where I am now, it belongs to Leslie Levy. And it is my understanding that that's the oldest office in West, uh, uh, or at least Southern California, Leslie Levy. He was a fabulous, he was a student of Walter Cohen. So he came here and he established this practice. And we have lots of patients from half a century ago. Up to now I'm talking to you, I have not heard one single patient to be positive or one single patient to be affected. I have not heard that. So do you think a lot of the scaring is they keep reporting case numbers instead of fatalities? Uh, tests are not reliable. I talked to you about that. We are mixing everything. That's not trisomy 21. That's not pregnancy test. 
Also, antibody IgG, IgM is different from cellular immunity. Also, we have been exposed to a good number of antigens because of the cousins of this virus. For all those reasons, the numbers are completely wrong, Hobart, completely wrong. And that's why, just ask your audience to think one more time. How do you accept that about 600,000 people are dead in the whole world and about 20% of them are in this are in this country? There is something wrong. And what do you think that wrong is? Why do you think uh, 20% of them are in this well, little country? You know, I just mentioned it to you. We have human metanomovirus, we have rhinovirus, enterovirus, mycoplasma pneumonia, parainfluenza. You are mixing everything together. Also, if we trust a stand for this study, that millions and millions of Americans are already positive. If they die because of heart attack, if they die because of cancer, if they die because of suicide, but with COVID-19, we are going to write COVID-19 because there is incentive. There is incentive. If you have used I, ventilator, I, there is incentive. If you have used some kind of treatment, the government is going to pay for that. There is no question about that. So remember, death with COVID-19 or death by COVID-19. I know my son went off the deep end when he found out uh, his buddy who died on a motorcycle, uh, you know, he tested positive for COVID-19, and that, that's what they put down, that, you know, he yeah. died of COVID-19. No, we, have, um, we, 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 have, we have three major vaccines in human trials right now. What, what are your thoughts on these vaccines, and how should we approach these? You know, in some countries, including America, it has good psychologic impact, good psychologic impact. But let me uh, look at it from a different angle. If this virus was edited... Is this virus was so bizarre, unknown, strange, mysterious, maybe even coming from galaxies, other galaxies. How was it possible months ago to make artificial messenger RNA of this virus by a company in America? How was it possible? How was it possible to make a vaccine? It's a very sophisticated science by another company in Germany months ago. And today we are entering phase three. So let me take your question and try to enlighten your audience from a different point of view. For months, we are talking about a very strange virus. I look at the members of the task force. We don't know. It's possible. Who knows? Who knows? But at the same time, there is a company who has made artificial messenger RNA based on information that was provided by our colleagues in China, based on information that was confirmed by our colleagues in Ernesto Pastor in France. According to Olivier Schwartz, we have never ever seen such beautiful collaboration between scientists, whether they are Chinese, whether they are Australians, whether they are from America. And that's why so many different com uh, companies, they were capable to be in phase three now. It means months after that. That's something that you should pay attention to. Now, number two, this is RNA virus. The target is very unique. It doesn't target the whole population. Very unique population. Predisposing factors, contributing factors, comorbidity, elderly population. Go back to Princess Cruz. Now we have to see, do we really need it? Do we really need it? Now, the psychologic impact is going to be positive. No question about that. But uh, I would prefer at that time, when something is out, to know if there has been any shortcut, and if also we have good data. And I would share that with our friends, our scientists in Taiwan, in Japan and in Korea, and Germany possibly, to make a decision. I wouldn't, uh, um, I wouldn't make any decision now, but definitely it's going to have a good positive psychological impact. You know, when I go to China, I mean, I, I, I thought I met the, the nicest, hardest working, most lovely people in the world, and it really stresses me when I see governments, you know, uh, you know, uh, not getting along when their people are so good. I mean, uh, they, they love hard work. They, they're, they're, they're fun. They're nice. They're honest. Was that your um, experience with Chinese dentists and periodontists and PhDs? Yes and no. There is a problem in China that we call it, we have a certain number of biases in statistics. A statistical bias it does not mean that you are not a good person. It's a statistical. It means you don't know that you are doing that. For example, odd ratio. It is two or three or four. You cannot make any definitive statement. But in China, there is something we call it promotion bias. If you exaggerate in interpretation of odds ratio, 
you have a better chance to get promotion. So routinely it's done. When it comes, for example, to p-value, even if it's not that significant, we see that in China, they're using the editing bias or publication bias much more. Or negative results are not published in China. Mainly positive outcomes are being published. There is a pressure from the country, there is a pressure from family members, there is a pressure from the government to have good results. We have more than one million publication in medical field from China, more than English language publication. So English and China, we have about 2 point some publications every year. And many, many, many of them are not reliable because of those statistical biases. So publication bias, promotion bias, negative results are not being published. There are so many of them that uh, if you read some beautiful papers published by Stanford, it will really help you a lot that the group in Stanford, they have identified a significant number of biases. I had two symposiums with uh, Steve Goodman, one of them, and two with uh, Yanidis that we talked about that. We talked about um, why many of our uh, research findings are not reliable. So Chinese are wonderful people, fantastic culture, no question about that. But at the same time, there is a pressure from family, pride of the country, to have a significant statistical biases in their publications. Um. I uh, one of the first things I got involved with when I was little is the um, the water fluoridation, and I'll never forget. You talked about the abuse of the scientific literature, and um, Kathleen uh, Smith out of Albuquerque, she wrote the abuse of the scientific literature in an anti fluoridation pamphlet, where they were showing you know they would show the molecule fluoride fluorine. It was in a rat poison, you know, but they just showed the fluorine, and that was supposed to be water fluoridation. But water fluoridation just never goes away, and they 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 talk about these studies in China about fluoride exposure, but it was they live near open um, burning uh, coal for electricity. What what is your thoughts of the scientific literature and water fluoridation, community fluoridation as of today in twenty twenty? You know, uh, let me be more general. Overall, our publications in dentistry are not reliable. Look at many products that we have and look at the publications. And why? Because we are publishing a lot too many case reports. We are publishing too many case series. A good number of our publications are supported by private industry. And even information coming from our universities are not reliable. Because uh, all you have to do is just to satisfy few students. There is no accountability. There is no accountability. That's a big problem that we have. I mean, even NIH is recognizing that, that we do not have enough good quality researchers in America. That's one of our biggest weak points. We do not have. Go, for example, today in any dental school in California and look at their publications. Extremely weak. Look at the CE courses that we are providing. Extremely weak. Lots of commercialism. That's a big problem that we have. We do even advertisements, something which was inacceptable for um, for the good generation. But today we can do advertisement, we can use commercialism. So we have a big big problem, and when it comes to fluoride, it's the same thing. You know, um, but I, I gotta put some of that blame on the dentist. Like when I started my dental journal, I believed all the things that you're saying. And so I started the Fran Report, no advertising, no nothing, you know, just pure meat and potatoes, and it was only uh, $119 a year, so it was $10 a month. Um, only 4,000 dentists subscribed to it from 94, 95, 96, 97, 98. So then when I said, okay, we'll make it advertising base and mail to everyone, then it exploded in volume. And yesterday, um, I, 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 you know, I'll post an article in the New York Times, and, and every time I publish that and uh, post that in Dental Town, I'll get two or three complaints by dentists I know that are friends that are rich, and they'll say, it's behind a firewall. How are we supposed to read it? I'm like, I don't know, maybe subscribe to the New York Times because they have a tall building and they have people that go to work there and they need computers. Um, so a lot of this stuff is just a, a personality, cultural issue where they don't want to pay for journalism, so they just get advertising. And, and, and the classic one, I'm going to hold your feet to the fire, I can't, I'm so excited to have you on the show, is Lenap. Um, you know, uh, these kids come out of school and they're like, I'm $400,000 in student loans. Do I need a $145,000 CAD cam, a $100,000 CBCT? And if I'm starting to place implants, I, I need those. But should I also get a $135,000 LENAP for a perio? What would you tell them being a periodontist? 
there is nothing uh, in literature to support enough. There is nothing. And what we see is like Mickey Mouse publication, really. It's not quality publication. <laughs> so I wouldn't invest so much on those devices. And you know, we know how to treat uh, inexpensively uh, periodontology. We have made it too complicated. Look at what we did with PRP, plasma rich protein. It comes, it goes. What we do with carbon, uh, it comes, it goes. We have seen it so many times. And again, the problem is that we don't have quality publications. And to get invited to many symposiums, the companies, they have to give money to those organizers so that you get invited. Um, but you know, I have been doing this symposium in Beverly Hills. I, have, I don't accept any sponsorship and I really get good, good crowds. I remember when I invited uh, Dr. Goodman, Steve Goodman, he's the, um, he's, the, uh, he's the dean of research in Stanford, he's a physician. And he was also very much impressed. He told me that. He said, I'm so glad to see that you can organize a symposium and you don't have a sponsor. And he said, when I go back, I will tell my colleagues that it can be done. And usually I get about 200, 300 people, really quality people, quality people. And they pay for, for the symposium and uh, we never make money, really. And if we do get money, I give it to, to my staff. So it is possible. I mean, that uh, still quality work. And I have always invited really wonderful people. Uh, I have tried to organize the same symposium in Taipei. I have had a significant number of meetings with Professor John Linde. I think about 10 symposiums we have organized together. I remember once with uh, Dr. John Linde, we were in uh, Taochung, and there was a big storm. And Dr. Linde told me that, oh, Hassan, nobody's going to come. So it was about like 10 to 9, it was completely empty, a storm, airport was closed, everything. I promise you, like at about 9 o'clock, the auditorium was packed. And we're trying to raise uh, some money as well for, for kids. Why? Because Jan Linde is class. Jan Linde is wonderful. You like him or you dislike him, there is no question that you know that he talks from his heart. You can trust him. That's really what makes him so unique. So I really think that you know, if we do have quality people like John Ioannidis, if we have quality people like Steve Goodman, if we have quality people like Jorgen Slots, if we have quality people like John Linde, people they would come, and they uh, can inspire our youth. They can inspire our youth. There's also a lot of research being promoted by the um, American Academy of Periodontology. You know the you know the people you know the linking periodontal disease to all kinds of things, Alzheimer's, heart disease, all kinds of things. Do you currently link periodontal disease to uh, as a causative factor of other diseases uh, in in the oral health continuum? You know, when you do epidemiological studies, you are not supposed to make any conclusion, and they forget about that. When you do epidemiological studies, you are not supposed to make any conclusion. What you do, the outcome can help you to generate hypotheses. And those hypotheses, then they have to be tested properly. And that's the problem with many of these studies. Some of the conclusions, they may be right. Some of the conclusions, they may not be correct. But the problem is that they all share the same problem that they have concluded based on studies that are not supposed to lead to any kind of conclusion. That's why we have gone as far as to say that is dementia, is Alzheimer, is uh, depression, is schizophrenia, is even divorce. I mean, that's, you just name it, they, can, they are linking it to, to something. You can always link anything you want to anything you want. And you have, you have to be careful. I'm so glad that you asked that question. Now, I did a study myself. I was trying to see whether or not periodontal disease where you have some viruses within the tissue, they can affect the outcome of uh, renal transplantation. I think the study design was good because renal transplantation is a good study model. And purposely, we turn off the immune system. And we know when we are going to turn it off to accept another kidney from a different person. So what we, we also had negative and positive control, both of them. And then we generated the hypothesis that possibly cytomegalovirus within periodontal pocket can lead to transplant failure. Uh, this is my own publication. But overall, overall, that uh, may all, many of these statements, at least, they remain statements. They have to be tested. They have to be tested properly. Um, I'll, I'll give you a, a class example of young kids in dental school. They start doing the research. They get on Dental Town. They say every time someone has a class five abfraction, my mom fills it in with composite. 
and then she's in dental school saying, I, I can't, she, telling me I, I can't even really figure out what it is because you see these abfractions in other animals and cattle and sheep and dogs. And, um, and she, when she asked her mom, why do you do this? She really can't find a great answer. What, what would you tell her? You know, there is something that we should practice. Is the following. What would happen if I do nothing? And we don't like it, but we should start lacking it and we should start practicing it. What would happen if I do nothing? And quite often the answer is nothing. Nothing would happen. That's why we do have really a problem with overtreatment. And that's why we have so many iatrogenic dentistry. That's why we are causing problems, especially in Western countries. What would happen if I do nothing? And the answer is quite often nothing. Nothing would happen. Let's go to COVID-19. Let's go to Sweden. In Sweden, we had about uh, 6,000 deaths, I think. And, uh, but if you look at, and they did nothing. Basically, I, I contacted a friend of mine in Sweden, Dr. Ingalil Personbacher. That's what she sent me last week. In Sweden, we kept primary and secondary schools open. In Sweden, we kept primary and secondary schools open. They never closed it. In Sweden, we did not do lockdowns, no lockdowns, minor rules for the citizens. And the strategy has worked. Now, it's true that they had more mortality versus Norway or Finland. But if you look at the mortality, you realize that it was mainly about 30 to 40 percent excess rate death was related to Somalis, the refugees from Africa, from Somalia, Somalis, Swedish people, that possibly due to cultural barrier and language barrier, they had higher mortality rate, but also to few nursing homes in Stockholm. So they, they did not manage properly certain uh, locations, nursing homes in Stockholm mainly, and Somali Swedish people, the refugees people, due to barrier, language barrier and cultural barrier. And I'm saying that to tell you that hopefully today in the whole world, we have enough positive control and negative control. Uh, to make a better uh, decision. And after seven months, it's not acceptable anymore to say that we don't have enough data to make proper decision. And going back again to your specific question in medicine, we should start practicing the following. What would happen if I do nothing? And quite often the answer is nothing. Nothing would happen. Um, your, of all the specialties, Periodontist has changed the most in my my career. I graduated in eighty seven, and it was all root planing, curatage. It was uh, surgeries, uh, vocation involvements. It was everything to save a human tooth. And then this revolution of titanium came, and it really took hold. That the best way to treat this vocation involvement is with forceps, extract the tooth, put in titanium. Now, now I'm coming up on uh, 32 years, and I see the trend coming back. A lot of people are looking at the implants and saying. I think I should have put all that effort into saving the old tooth. Um, you've lived through that. You've been at the forefront for these three decades. Um, what do you think of the uh, evolution from uh, mechanical debridement, surgery, uh, to extraction, titanium, and where are we at now, and where do you see us going forward? You know, uh, oral hygiene instructions and scaling root planning, hand instrumentation works. Fabulously, it works. And we have seen that. We have lots of literature to support that. Again, my practice, because of Leslie Levine and because of what Jan Linde told him. I remember once with Professor Jan Linde and uh, Dr. Leslie Levine, we were all here in this office. And uh, Leslie Levine told Dr. Linde that I have been practicing what you suggested. And it has been really working. We have so many patients that they are in their 90s, they are in their 80s, thanks to Dr. Levine that they have their dentition, and they didn't have any of these fancy treatments. They didn't have any of these fancy surgical procedures. They didn't have any of these products. And I really am here, well positioned to tell you that I'm so happy to continue that. So we do have literature to support that, and we, I do have a practice to support that. But unfortunately, we were bombarded suddenly by poor quality so-called researchers, by lots of uh, uh, infomercials, and suddenly teeth they were extracted, artificial bone or bone from a cow or a cadaver was placed. And now you have millions of implants that are placed into these fake bones and it's a time bomb. And that's why we see more and more complications and failures with implants. 
So I'm glad that there is a big trend to go back to where we were before, because where, what we were using before is working. Oral hygiene instructions, hand instrumentations. You don't need anything fancy, done properly. Done properly, it means that you just follow Anna Pattison. Anna Pattison, she's one of our hygienists. She's known all over the world. They know her in Switzerland, they know her in Sweden, wherever I go, I'm so proud of her. I worked with her, her department for many years when I was at USC. And if you apply instrumentation the way that she was using, and iodine irrigation, and dead sea salt, oral hygiene, it's just wonderful, uh, the outcome you get. Um, a, another big debate, and I've even, I even saw this debate, two brothers who are implantologists, one would never place an implant on a smoker. Another one uh, says, you know, they, smokers need doctors too. Um, COVID-19, um, we saw at first when it came out in March that smoking was a bad deal. And then a lot of researchers said it's really not that significant. Um, how do you view smoking as a, um, would you place an implant in a smoker? And uh, do you think that smoker is a, um, that's a pre uh, uh, a condition that's going to um, help them get COVID-19? No, no, I would use it for a smoker. I would use you, it. And I, you, would, you would place an implant in a smoker? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, smoking is, we go through the whole educational part with our patients. Many, many times it's very difficult for them to stop it. Many times it's very difficult. And also literature, which is not young anymore, old literature, shows that uh, if they don't change their mind, they continue to smoke, you should not deprive them from implant placement. And uh, I know that when I was in Brussels, a part of my study was done in a hospital, Erasmus Hospital, and we had lots of patients next to Gothenburg. That was the second center that implant dentistry, Brandmark system, uh, started, initi they initiated that. And we had many, many patients that they were smokers. And they had these famous four implants and hybrid with a significant distal extension. So, of course, you know, we have to encourage them to stop it, but I don't uh, deprive them from implant placement because they continue to smoke. Well, Italy had a big outbreak. Um, uh, that's a country that smokes a lot. And my joke in China when, I, when, I, when I'm in China is that the restaurant has the smoking section and the chain smoking section. <laughs> um, so, so back to COVID, where do you see um, smoking playing in on um, catching COVID uh, when you see such diverse, you know, behaviors of um, smoking. Well, you know, COVID, COVID is going to target specifically lung. That's really the target. I mean that, and I, I'm sure that patients, people that are smokers, they know that. They have heard enough. Cardiovascular disease, breathing problem, cancer, and now a virus that can target your lung. It's really up to them to make the decision. But definitely it's a risk factor, no question about that. You're so um, you're you're so brave. I I love people that just have freedom of speech. I mean, you, you if you believe it, you'll say it. Um, so I don't mean to be throwing you under a bus asking these questions, but um, um, the pinhole surgical technique. Um, some p other people tried a different technique that they thought was kind of the same, and and there was actually you know people fighting over the use of the name. I mean, it's like a proprietary. Well, what is your thoughts on the pinhole surgical technique? And is it so unique that it really is a patentable, um, copyrighted technique? Or what, what are your thoughts on that? No, there is nothing new about that. If you go back to decades ago, in oral surgery, it was used, especially, I think, by Dr. Mullmans years ago in uh, Flemish countries, that they would get small access to inject hydrox uh, uh, HA, HA particles. So to get a small access to raise the flap without raising the flap from the coronal part and then to insert something is nothing new. So you're, um, where, where, where were you born in Tehran? In Shiraz. Okay. Um, so you probably know the inventor of MTA, Mohammed Torej Benat, uh, Tao Benish, how do you say his name? Mohammed? Torah Benishat. Yeah. So he invented MTA. So I got to ask you what you thought of MTA. 
And uh, my gosh, if you get them to come on the show, I mean, uh, I mean that was uh, amazing. There's so many rumors about that story. Some say that it was invented when he was sitting by his swimming pool and was watching the sim- swimming pool maintenance man repair the wall of his swimming pool. And he said, what is that? It works underwater. And that's what MTA is. And I, I want to podcast him to... Because that's a big, a big story. You don't know what's bigger, the man or the myth. But uh, did your butt do, do you know him? Is he your friend? And did he invent it? Drinking a, a gin and tonic by a swimming pool, watching the uh, swimming pool repairman fix the pool. You know, um, Trovin Ejad and myself, we have never met each other. One day, he called me, and he said that he was writing a book, and he wants me to write a chapter or two. And I accepted because I have heard only good things about him. We published, he published a book. I wrote two chapters. And uh, still, we have not met each other. And still, up to now, I have heard only good things about him. So there is something that I know about him, that he's a good man. Uh, he's a good scientist. He's a bright scientist. He's very sincere. So he's the same category as we just talked about, like Jorgen Sloss. You may like him, you may dislike him, but no question that he speaks his mind. He's those old-fashioned European scientists. We talk about Professor Jan Linde. We talk about Sue Nyman, this wonderful generation, Sopransky. And uh, that's why I really have lots of respect for him when it comes to MTA. So I really don't know the details of that, but I trust the man. Well, it sounds like we should do another podcast with the three of us. Well, it'll be... Well, th- all three of us there on this part. Um, we we have um in in wartime they call weapons. These are dumb weapons that kills everyone, and these are specific weapons that kills exactly the one thing. Some people are using that analogy with mouthwash. That you know these people that switch with Listerine, you're killing just as many good bags, bug bags. It's a indiscriminate dumb technique. What what is your thoughts? Um, um, when, when you look at periodontal uh, disease, um, a periodontist Perry Radcliffe out here. He says that was the same story when he watched his swimming pool person putting chlorine in acid. Um, he started chlorine dioxide, and it was called uh, retardant, and then they changed the name uh, to chlorosil or something like that. But w- what is your thoughts overall on mouthwashes for patients with periodontal disease? You know, we have to change our culture. Microbes are our best friends. Bacteria are our friends, best friends. You and I, we have more than 100,000 viral elements in our DNA, viral viruses. And because of those viral elements, we don't die. You know, you should be surprised that human being, human's body is not as strong. We are surrounded by billions and trillions of bacteria and viruses. But why we don't die? Why we do survive? One reason is that within our DNA is more than 100,000 viral elements. Now, when it comes to bacteria, the same thing. Your eyes are wet. Your mouth is wet, your ear, but why they don't get infected? Your first line of defense is not your immune system. Your first line of defense are these viruses and bacteria. They protect you. Like for example, now on your skin, Howard, you have about 500 different species. They protect you, they are your friends. The same thing with your face. The same thing in your digestive system. For example, your serotonin, about, 90% is made in your digestive system because of the microorganisms. Your dopamine, the same thing. Vitamin K, coagulation. If you deprive people from microbiome, you're going to hurt them. So our friends in Sweden, they made a mistake decades ago. They got involved with tremendous hygiene, tremendous hygiene. Even when the baby was born, they would take the baby from mom to wash the baby immediately so that the baby doesn't get contaminated. What was the result? Increase in asthmatic patients, increase in immune uh, diseases, increase in uh, allergic reactions, and then they change the policy. Now kids, uh, they, they, they are given back to mom, they are contaminated by microbes of the mom, they play in parks, and so more and more we are becoming familiar with this notion of microbiome, they are our friends. So you do not want to use a mouthwash that kills 99.9% of the microorganisms. That's the last thing you want to use. You don't want to kill your friends. A small number of microbes are really our enemies. And actually, they become our enemies because their numbers go up. So we have to change our culture. Bacteria are our friends. Vitamin K, vitamins, coagulation, neurotransmitters are made by them. 
your first line of defense or microorganism within your immune system, DNA, one of your first lines of defense are viral elements. So we really have to change our culture. And I disagree with many, many of these mouthwashes that they are using all these chemicals to so-called kill more than 99% of your bacteria. So you would stop using it? Absolutely. Yes. Uh, the waste of money. Uh, speaking of waste of money, um, you know, someone comes in, they're on three month recall, and when the hygienist, if she wants to full mouth probe and chart, you have to send in, you know, a twenty dollar an hour assistant to assist your forty dollar an hour hygienist. So it's always been, everyone asks every three months on Dental Town, how often do you have to probe and record? And no, you know, usually the patients they become familiar with the hygienist. That's the whole beauty of what was suggested by Sue Nyman and Professor Jan Linde many, many decades ago, and then by Walter Cohen and, and Leslie Lepin, that uh, we overreact many times, we over-treat, uh, we over-diagnose. Predontology is so easy to manage. And even if you have a forcation, in the absence of treatment, your forcation class two is not going to become class three the next week or the next month or the next year. Patients, they come back, you see that still there is not that much difference. And what's the message in that? Do minimum and enjoy the outcome. Do minimum and enjoy the outcome versus do a lot and then blame it on the disease, blame it on lack of oral hygiene. So predontal pocket is a slowly progressing problem. So if you, you can manage it and you can manage it easy. Again, we have uh, anapatison, we have instrumentation, hand instrumentation. You don't need all these fancy devices, all those electronic devices. You really don't need it. Now, when patients, they come back, they should stay with the same hygienist because the hygienist really knows their personality. Hygienist knows what they are drinking, what they are eating, if there is any change. And they trust hygienists. There's a beautiful relationship. Here in uh, my office is the same thing. Uh, Dr. Levin, to begin with, he had nine hygienists and we had uh, seven different sections. So each patient would go with a hygienist and he would go to check once in a while if there was something to check. And, and, and that's why I really think that, you look at recession. Every single periodontist probably has recession in their mouth, but do they really do a, a root coverage? Not really, because recession is not a disease. It's, we are overreacting. We don't need all these graftings. And then we inject PRP, PRA, this kind of tissue, that kind of tissue, 908 or suture, use our microscope, for something that maybe to begin with didn't need anything. A small, small percentage, percentage of uh, periodontal recessions, they need active treatment and they can be managed again by the hygienist. And if it goes out of control, hygienist is the first to detect it. So what we do on a routine basis, we calibrate them. We have meetings together and they have meetings with patients. But overall, I really want to say something to your audience that uh, stay away from all these expensive treatments, stay away from all these fancy surgical procedures. Gingival recession is not a disease. If you have a forcation, do a good instrumentation, irrigate it with uh, diluted iodine if they are not allergic. Use dead sea salt that you can buy it for nothing and dilute it and uh, irrigate it, and you would enjoy really the outcome. And like in our practice, Leslie Levin's practice, Gothenburg practice, you are going to have patients in their 90s and 100 that uh, they have the, their, their dentition. A lot of people um, lost faith in flossing when the New York Times posted an article last year that said there's zero evidence that flossing is a thing. And um, and it, it's a big debate with patients. And, and for several months, I had several patients. They couldn't wait till I told them, how you floss it? And they're like, don't you read, Doc? The newspaper said there's no research. What, what, what was your thought of that event? You know, uh, first, it depends on your dentition. Some people with poor oral hygiene and no flossing, they have no problem, but you don't see too many of them. And let's say, for example, if you have an open contact, overcrowding, malpositioning versus not having them. When you do have malpositioning, when you do have poor contouring, when you do have open contact, you get a food infection and you must floss. So overall, patients, they must floss. You don't want it to give it the benefit of doubt, basically. They must floss. Now, Going back to old days, I published an article, if you are interested to read it, I um, explained the evolutionary aspect of uh, our uh, face from 550 million years ago up to now. If you go back to million years ago, other humans, not Homo sapiens sapiens, you know, they didn't have 
too many cavities, too many decades. So having cavities is also big time related to our way of living, our culture. So it's just a whole collection of everything. We cannot just target flossing, or we cannot find some cases that people that are not brushing correctly, they are not flossing correctly, but they have no problem. We see that also with, uh, with periodontal disease. So overall, in America, in Australia, in Canada, in France, in England, in Japan, in Korea, in Taiwan, we must uh, brush uh, at least twice a day, and we must floss once a day before going to bed. Um, there was another article um, by The Atlantic published um, just, um, it was uh, just two days ago. It said, Americans are spending billions on unnecessary dental treatment. The evidence that braces make you healthier is shaky at best. And immediately, the periodontist started coming in and saying, if you don't straighten the teeth, they'll have perio. And straightening the teeth prevents perio. Then other TMJ people got on, said it prevents TMJ. Others got on and sleep apnea and says it prevents sleep apnea. Um, I mean, ortho. Um, is, is it... Um, they used to call it the BMW back in 87. I don't know if that's still a term. Biological minimum width that if the incisors, if all their roots are touching each other and there's not a millimeter and a half of bone, there's not enough bone for circulation and flow. So the succinct question is, um, does orthodontics prevent, does youthful orthodontics prevent elderly periodontics? You know, um, we are overreacting. We are overtreating people. There's a big problem that we have here. And again, but having said that, over the last many, many years, it goes back to our evolution. We don't have enough room for all of our teeth. And our vertical branch is not vertical anymore. It's curved. Our maxilla is becoming smaller. Our teeth are becoming smaller. For example, our canines from 15 millimeters, now they are 9 to 11 millimeters, the same height as central incisor. Our lateral incisors, about 0.5 to 1 millimeter, even shorter than central incisors. So we have had lots of changes and lots of discrepancies. Why? Because they are coming from different places. They are coming from ectoderm, sometimes from mesoderm, sometimes ectomesenchymal. And so everything, this discrepancy in our face, with our jaw, with our teeth, goes back to where they are coming from. It goes back to their evolution, basically. So we are going to have lots of problems, but does it mean that every single problem has to be addressed medically? The answer is no. Because that's how we are. That's our homo sapiens sapiens. And that's why we go back to the same famous question. What would happen if I do nothing? And quite often the answer is nothing. So I would be very careful not to go directly to public to encourage them to do extensive treatments because uh, you, you would like to promise them something that so, is not going to happen. So you're, um, you're at USC, correct? No, not anymore. I'm not at USC anymore. But, but that, that's where you were an instructor for a long time. That's right. I went to school, my period, I went to school. And my specialty, I did in, uh, uh, at USC, I mean, at USC. And then Jorgen Slavs uh, came to USC. And when I finished my studies, he offered me the directorship position, which was a big honor for me. So we made a team together. And then we had this well-known microbiology lab. And then we had a good clinic. We really became a good team. It was only two of us. There was nobody else. But over time, I had few graduates, and I asked them to come back to school to teach. And over time, we have this good department. It was clinically very strong, microbiologically very strong. Then we got this interest in viruses. So we published a lot about cytomegalovirus, herpes simplex 1 and 2, uh, herpes simplex 6, 7, 8, about Epstein-Barr virus 1 and 2, enteroviruses. Um, and then uh, also we had the uh, thanks to Jorgen Strauss, this Periodontology 2000, that up to now still is ranked number one in the world. And Dr. Strauss trusted me to uh, let me edit one of the issues. So when you were there, was uh, the Dean uh, Avishai Sedan? Sedan? How do you say it, pronounce that? Avishai Sedan? No, I really don't care about him. But when I was there, uh, uh, the dean was uh, Howard Lundsman. Um, Well, specifically to, to USC or private schools, like I'm in Phoenix, so we have Midwestern, that's a private school, $100,000 a year. We have Midwestern, it's $100,000 a year. A lot of people are starting to complain that um, the education system is not keeping one eye on the child, student, and one eye on cost. Um, they just keep, um, they, 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 they have no cost control. And when you 
talk to PhD economists, and they show you, you know, the rate of inflation from 1950 to 2020, and then the rate of inflation of education, it's completely disconnected that you don't see in several other industries like housing and transportation, electricity, things like that. What do you um, think of now just routinely having dental school cost $100,000 a year? Well, one of the faculty was arrested by the FBI. What does it mean? I really don't know. The C department is shut down. Uh, there are lots of problems. Look at Singer. FBI is talking about Singer about one of the biggest or the biggest educational scandal in the history of America. I mean, I leave, let, leave it to you to see what is going on. Okay, you said they arre the re arrested, uh, the FBI arrested Singer, S-I-N-G-E-R? Exactly, yeah. And what was the other name? Well, he's the guy who was, I'm, I don't want to mention name, but I'm saying that. It's dentistry uncensored. You can spell the name. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. See, but I'm, because I you know. have to wait for the trial. People are innocent. They have to go to trial. But I want to say that that's where we are today. That's where we are today. I mean that uh, USC had a wonderful reputation. I was so proud of USC. Had a wonderful reputation. But I remember I was in New Zealand. Even the taxi driver had heard about this scandal. I went to China, they had heard about that. You go to France, they have heard about that. I mean, the reputation is damaged, definitely. And look at the quality of publications. Look at the quality of graduates. What can I say? But I can tell you that uh, the, the, the most important thing in any uh, school is integrity. If integrity is gone, you lose the culture. You lose that pride. And at least when I was a student there and when I was teaching there, the pride was there. You were proud of the history, the exceptional history of that department. We were proud of Periodontology 2000. We were proud of our symposiums. We were proud of our clinical publications. We were really proud. And uh, Jorgen Slaus was telling me a few weeks ago that time, uh, your publications has passed the test of time. Many of my publications, they were controversial. I published an article that saying that Nobel Perfect from Nobel Biopair is not what they claim to be. And uh, even in school, they went after me. I published an article about bovine bone, that bovine bone is not what they claim to be. You can read all those my publications, editorials. But again, I published an article about guided tissue regeneration, that it is not what it's claimed to be. But again, as I said, I'm quoting Jürgen Slots that time, uh, we have passed the test of time. Our publications have passed the test of time. So I just, at this time, I just wish them the best, but I'm not in touch with them anymore. I'm just in touch with a uh, few faculty and Jürgen Slots. So Singer, you were talking about the college admission scheme mastermind, William Rick Singer, who wore a wire to expose the scam. And yes. says, I put everything in place, he told a federal judge. So do you think that, um, so is, is that trial coming soon? And what do you, what do you think is going to be the... the, um, the I, I'm using this example to tell you that there is a problem. I mean, that I have hard time to accept that they didn't know about that. I mean, there is a problem. There is a problem that people, they get money to get in. So maybe we should go back and check all the certificates again. Maybe you should go back and check the program directors. You should go back and check the associate deans and deans. And hopefully, USC is doing that. Because, uh, uh, but 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 back to back to the uh, the final cost. Do you? Um, I mean, I remember um, when um, some of the schools when when the first school got to like forty grand, and I thought forty grand a year, wow. And then it was like they all it was like a horse race. I mean, just like everybody everybody was raising ten a year and. It was no time at all, and I mean, I don't know how many schools charge one hundred thousand dollars a year, but it seems like a quarter of them do. I mean, no, of do, course, do... of course, it's too expensive. Of course, it's expensive. And look at the quality of faculty. For that faculty, so much money, I would never pay that. I would never pay that. So it, it is too high cost. Um, my no, gosh, it is a shameful cost. It's truly shameful cost. I mean, that that's abuse of the educational system. And it's very simple to check that. You just calculate how many hundreds of dollars you're paying your child is paying daily, daily, and look at the quality of their faculty. 
Yes. Um, my God, I, you know, I, I, I could talk to you for 40 days and 40 nights, but I know you're 100,000 times busier than I am, and I feel uh, guilty uh, stealing your time. How, how long? Um, my gosh, we went over. Um, and we're, we had two hours? Holy yes. moly, my God, two hours. Um, I guarantee you everyone listening is just honored that you came on the show. Um, a big shout-out to Jason Hill. How, how do you know Jason Hill? Oh, you know, I had a presentation in Arizona, and that's how I got to meet with him. And then he invited me a few more times. And I know a few other people in Arizona. And I can tell you truly, I mean, that him, his family, I mean, that wonderful, wonderful people. And I really enjoyed um, presenting there. And what I like about him is that he knew that my publications are controversial. And he knew that I have no affiliation with any company. He couldn't find anybody to sponsor me. And still he invited me. And then he asked me uh, to go to a hotel or to go to his house. And I had the honor, really, the privilege to go to his house to meet with his wife, his children. We had a wonderful time together. And uh, when he introduced uh, me to you, I didn't hesitate a second. I really that, love him. Love him. That's, love that's his true. Time. Is, especially when you lecture overseas, like they're, you know, they're saying, oh, we're going to put you up in the nicest hotel. It's like, I've stayed in a Sheridan before. I, I, I want to stay in your house. I'll never forget my first lecture in Warsaw, Poland. And I, I got up early and I opened up the refrigerator. I was shocked. I mean, I'd never opened up a Polish refrigerator for. And it didn't look like any refrigerator I'd ever seen in the United States. And I think that's the coolest part of going to a country is seeing how they live, how they eat, how they talk to their children. I mean, it, it's just it's just the most uh, fun thing. Uh, but where does that come from with you? Where Why are some people like, I mean, I call my show Dentistry Uncensored. I just, if I believe it, I'm going to share it with you. Why, why do you think so many dentists are afraid to say what they really think? I'll give you, an, I'll give you a clear-cut example. You'll go to a course, and you'll listen to the lecture for eight hours. Then that night, you're at a bar, and you ask him the same question, and he just lets it rip the answer. And I'm like, well, why didn't you say that at the podium? I mean, when, when, when I asked at the podium, you went to a slide, and you pointed, and I, I didn't even know what you meant. But, man, at the bar, two beers later, you just told it like it was. Where, where, where is that disconnect? You know, because we think it's granted. Because sometimes you are born here and we think it's granted. And you just you want to follow the flow. And uh, a person like me, I know how wonderful America is. I've lived in Iran. I have lived in France. I've lived in Belgium. And I'm now living here. And I go back and forth a lot in Europe. And I really think that it's a big, big honor to be American. And if you are American, it's about freedom. There is something about the constitution of this country which is so unique. Look at, I'm not white American, and Jason is. And Jason is Christian, I'm not. And he invites me, he invites me to his house, and he invited me to his church. And it was truly a wonderful experience. And this has been experience, the same experience I had at USC. I get to USC, I'm a new graduate. Jorgen Estot is coming from Copenhagen, from Denmark. And he tells me, look, you are going to be the director. And I was so young. I was the youngest director in the history of USC. Not a single time I have experienced discrimination, a single time. This is the most wonderful country, really, I have lived in. This is the most wonderful country I've lived in. And don't think that is granted. And now I really feel that I have responsibility. I will fight for this country if I have to. But there is something that I learned. This country is based on freedom and integrity. If you lose your integrity, your numbers are going to be like task force. Your numbers are going to be like the projection model. Your numbers are going to be like the World Hair Organization. Your numbers are going to be like CDC. It's all about integrity. It's all about integrity. And if you look at uh, Apple, if you look at Boeing, why they are so successful? If you look at Elon Musk, because there is accountability. Because there is freedom of expression, but there is accountability. You better do it. You better deliver. Otherwise, they will fire you. They don't mess with you. Look at the uh, uh, artificial intelligence. I work with, uh, I have done a few programs with one of them, one of the scientists in artificial intelligence. And he was telling me that there are about 500 PhD in Malibu, not too far from where I am. And he said they have absolutely no forgiveness. If I made the slightest mistake, they will fire me. They have no mistake. So America is, is this whole beautiful uh, combination, professionalism. You can be Buzz Aldrin. 50 years ago, you land on moon on time. You are Gore Vidal. You speak your mind. And that's what I learned from him as well. We really had a wonderful time. He was inviting me to his house for dinner. 
it was me and it was one of the granddaughters of Roosevelt. And sometimes I remember we had these fantastic opera singers, but otherwise it was only two or three of us. And I could see that how much he cares about this country, but at the same time I was enjoying that, uh, that uh, how uh, brave he was, how brave he was. And one day he told me, look, um, uh, I'm going to England to give a talk in a parliament. And he went there and he had a standing ovation. And then he gave a talk in Thailand, King of Thailand invited him. And then he was giving talk for other countries, completely the opposite. He was going everywhere. And that's really something that you see in this country, this professionalism to dare, to be brave, but to be protected at the same time. Nobody can touch you. Nobody can touch you, except if you do something illegal, they can go after you. But me personally, this is really my experience. To me, this country is not a racist country. I'm brown. I have not a single time, a single time I've experienced that. I've been invited by the biggest organizations of this country, not a single time. They told me, is there a question you want me to ask you or not to ask you? I mean, that they live, I mean, that's wonderful, really wonderful people. Yourself, you know, you contacted me, you told me that you are going to meet uh, at 10 o'clock and uh, you, you can ask me anything you like. And we have to be really grateful, it's not granted. Is not granted, and you can lose it overnight. Let me tell you, you can lose it overnight. One generation, it takes only one generation to lose it. And the most important thing to do for America is to invest on education. I'm not at USC anymore, but let me tell you something, people at USC. Integrity is the name of the game, integrity. If you lose that integrity, you will continue to go down. Um, last but not least, kind of a joke. My Iranian friends say that when someone uh, refers to them as Persian versus Iranian, they're 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 too politically uh, af afraid to say Iranian. So do do uh, do is it politically correct to call you a Persian because they're afraid of the of saying Iranian? You know, um, look, I mean, Bebel is right. I have lots of well-known people here as patients. It really doesn't matter. I have never experienced anything negative. I really mean it. Not a single time. You call me Iranian, you call me Persian. I'm not, I'm not. And I have a whole range from dark skin to light skin. I mean that I have the whole range from people in Hollywood, people in industry, people in Washington. I mean, I, I have not really experienced that. And of course we have big points. Every country has big points. But overall, this is a country that we must celebrate. This is a country that we must be loyal to its constitution. This is really a country that we have to be so proud of this country. It's just unbelievable. It's just unbelievable. And all the time, every day, I look at myself in the mirror. I look at myself in the mirror. I said, look, I'm going to this Bebelis, this fancy place. I was a director here. I was advising the minister in Italy. I was editor in chief of the journal. Jorgen Estos told me to be the editor of Predontology 2000. I have edited a few journals in France. I have never experienced anything. And that's really something that in Western countries, we have to protect it. We must protect it. There's no have responsibility. You, have you ever... Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, th this is a great country. I mean, there's only one country I've ever lectured in out of about 50 that I thought, uh, I, I think I might have rather stayed there, but that was Sydney, Australia, and my brother lives there. But uh, I don't think if my brother didn't live there, but uh, yeah, I, I, it's still it's still a great country. And that, that's why I tell Americans... Uh, um, you know, some of the young kids I've heard talk to, they want to move to Canada. And I said, well, you, you don't give up on America. I mean, I, how many, I mean, humans are a million years old, 120 billion of them died. Stay here and make it, make it better. I mean, if there's a problem, fix it. Don't run and hide. But Absolutely. for you to give me and my homies two hours of your time, what a treat. Um, if you ever want to come back or any of your other friends want to come on, I mean, I, I look at your uh, so, uh, your website. What website should they go to to learn more about you? Is no, it BeverlyHillsPerioImplant.com? No, 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 no. No, no. If they go to Medline, Medline or Public Medical Library and check my publications. Right. PubMed. That's the best one. And then, uh, you know, and I... That's where you have 84 publications? Yes, I, I wasn't going to post mine on Medline until I had 100, so I'm still waiting until I get 100. Okay. Then I'm going to post them all at once. And, you know, Howard, if you let me, I just finished a documentary that hopefully is going to come out soon. And it's called Race. And I explain why race has no biologic basis. And briefly, I'm going to explain that in five minutes, if you allow me. That if you look at, for example, President Obama, 
His mom is from Kansas, white. And his grandmother, grandfather are from Europe, white. And his father is from Kenya. Now, your mother gives you more DNA than your father. It's a mistake that we say 50-50. The reality is that your DNA, mostly, more DNA is coming from mother. And the energy, the, the, the power plant of your cells are coming from your mother. And the sexual cell of the mother is 100,000 times bigger than the sperm of father. But also nine months, you are going to be inside your mom. But why we call him the first president of black race? Now, if you look at uh, Tiger Woods, Tiger Woods is Native American from father's side and Chinese. And from mother's side is from Thailand and Dutch, Thailand, Dutch and Chinese. So why we don't call him the first Chinese golf champion. It's very interesting. The father's side, Chinese. The mother's side, Thailand and Chinese and Dutch. But we call him the first black race golf champion. So hopefully we are not going to fall in the prison of our eyes anymore. Our hearts are red, our bones are white, our brain is grayish white, but we keep looking at our skin. Race has no biologic races. Today, all over the earth, we have only one race, and that's Homo sapiens sapiens. This word has three sections, Homo sapiens sapiens. The last one in biology relates to race, or the French people, they call it la race. So if they ask you what your race is, your race is sapiens. I'm black, I'm white, I'm red, I'm yellow, they're all wrong. They have no scientific basis. Um, it's true. I, I was born in Kansas, and I can tell you that being born in Kansas, it was very confusing to uh, my, my family, everyone, that uh, he never even mentioned his mother born in Kansas. I mean, uh, even when he was uh, talking to people in Kansas, like it's like he, it, I mean, I, I don't know anyone that I'm aware of that could go eight years and all those speeches and never mention his mother. Why, why do you think that was? No, I don't know, but I just want to tell you that this documentary should come out. It's a nice documentary. It's a good film. I have a good uh, team. I have a good crew. And hopefully I will inform you. Uh, maybe your audience would like to watch it. But so so that movie, what killed... Okay, well, are, are you talking about what killed the smile of Hatchpoots, a woman who was a pharaoh, short documentary? No, that's a documentary I did many years ago. I did a symposium with Gore Bidal, and we talk about ancient Egypt. And ancient Egypt, about... 3,500 years ago, we have a pharaoh who is a woman, Hatshepsut, is a woman. And she was wonderful in education, transportation, science. What she did is unbelievable. Just check Google Hatshepsut. So one day I decided to make a movie and I told Gore Vidal that I don't have budget for that. And he told me it doesn't matter. What matters is this story. And I think there is a good story. So I made this short documentary, What Kid the Smile of Hatshepsut. It's a short documentary. And he was nice enough to come with me in few film festival. So from a cinematography point of view, it's nothing really, it's nothing. But maybe there's a nice story. But the bottom line is that we are celebrating a woman, a woman who was the king of the kings, a woman who was a pharaoh, ancient Egypt, 3,500 years ago. We have about 700, seven women in uh, pharaoh Egypt, and we have more than 100 um, ministers, secretary of science, secretary of this and that in ancient Egypt that unfortunately we don't know. So my goal with that first documentary was to uh, celebrate the ancient Egypt. And I was lucky enough to win a few awards for that. And they, they can watch it on my nozerisymposium.com. But the, this one I'm talking about, the race, I just finished it. It's going to come out soon. Well, um, it when, when it comes out and release, come back, uh, send me a Absolutely. link, come back on the show. Any Anything our platform can do, whether it's the Dentaltown Magazine, the Dentaltown Absolutely. website. Uh, there's 2 million dentists on Earth, and we passed the 50th percentile. We're digitally connected to over Absolutely. 1 million now. So Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. I will do that. I appreciate you. Thank you so much. You, pr you, you told me you gave me an hour of your life, and you gave me two and a half. Thank you so much. No, I should, uh, let me give you a kiss <laughs> and your audience, really. I mean, that is a big honor for me. And thank you so much for giving me this opportunity with no precondition, with no precondition to talk to you, to talk to your audience. And if I did say anything that it can hurt people or 
they think it was insulting. I apologize for that. And if you ever come back to Phoenix, um, you, me, and Jason should go out to dinner, and um, it might, and it'll be the only time. If you, me, and Jason went to dinner, it'll be the only time I've ever seen where the bald man isn't the smartest one in the room. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, have a good day. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you. Thank you.